Good afternoon and welcome to the United States Institute of Peace. A special welcome to those, of, those joining us by live webcast. My name is Raymond Gilpin. I lead the Institute, Institute's work on economics. I have two quick announcements. First, during the question and answer session, we'll be taking questions by cue cards. And so please write your questions on the um, cue cards we have provided. And after our distinguished guest's remarks, we will collect them and pose as many to her as time permits. And those joining us by webcast, you could send your questions via email or Twitter. Details are available on our website. Um, second, I'll ask you all to join me, particularly you in the auditorium, to join me in the silencing of the cell phone ceremony. <laughs> it's as a courtesy to our distinguished guests and others, and also because the cell phones interfere with our AV equipment. So, if it rings, buzzes, beeps, or sings, let's use this, take this opportunity to switch them off. Thank you very much for that. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our Executive Vice President, Tara Sonnenschein, who would offer some opening remarks. Please welcome Tara Sonnenschein. <laughs> Thank you so much, Raymond, for your leadership of our conflict and sustainable economies work. You are truly our peace economist, and every country and institution should have one. Um, I want to acknowledge the presence here today of the Liberian delegation traveling with the president, and also to welcome the ambassador, Liberia's ambassador to Washington, I'd like to welcome Johnny Carson, the Assistant Secretary of State for Africa, and a special welcome, too, to General Carter Ham, Commander of AFRICOM. Would you join me in welcoming them today? <laughs> I'm delighted that the U.S. Institute of Peace Board members are here, Kerry Kennedy, uh, George Moose, Chet Crocker, whom you'll be hearing from in a moment. We have great crowd here, a crowd up above, a crowd, unfortunately, in the overflow room. I guess we need a bigger building. Um, <laughs> and crowds online everywhere. The United States Institute of Peace is deeply and passionately committed to Liberia's steady growth and development, to its overall stability, and to conflict resolution on the continent. In 2008, we supported the development of Liberia's National Law Reform Commission in collaboration with Liberian researchers and George Washington University. In 2010, we conducted research on perceptions of justice in Liberia, which resulted in a major publication. In April, 2010, we co-sponsored Liberia's National Conference on Enhancing Access to Justice. The opening address was given by President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. And we are now working at the Institute on a national action plan, which the State Department is committed to, developing a U.S. national action plan on gender and conflict. And we are very proud to know that Liberia is one of the nations that has a national action plan, and so America is modeling itself in part on you. So there are many great connections and bridges, and we are very fortunate today to have as the introducer of our special guest, a man who knows her well. Ambassador Crocker served in just the position of Assistant Secretary of State, that Johnny Carson holds for Africa. Chet Crocker mediated many disputes in Africa, has worked in this area for a very, very long time, and we are proud that he's a member of the board, professor at Georgetown University, author of many books, and I am really honored to introduce Ambassador Chet Crocker.
Madam President, distinguished members of the visiting Liberian delegation, and we've recognized many other important personages who are here with us today. But Madam President, it is a great honor for me to have the opportunity to say a few words about you. You don't really need an introduction, in fact, um, but I'm gonna give you one anyway. Um, you bring to our forum such a remarkable wealth of experience as a private banker, as an international civil servant, as a presidential contestant during the really bad years, as a political prisoner, as a political exile, as a venture capitalist, as a founder of women's movements in your country and in the region, and now as president of your country for five years. On a personal level, having served with you on an advisory board in a private equity uh, organization, I know that you ask the toughest questions of an investment proposal that I've ever heard. Two of my former students have had the pleasure of serving in your administration and confirm that the challenge of working under your standards are higher than the standards received at Georgetown University, and that's saying something for a professor at Georgetown <laughs> University. Over 250,000 people lost their lives during the traumatic 14 years of the Liberian Civil War, and the country was nearly destroyed. The story of Liberia since 2003, and especially since your inauguration in 2006, is the story of a dramatic, dramatic turnaround. Sure, there are still problems, but under your leadership, Madam President, so much has been accomplished. The return of stability, the attraction of very substantial foreign investment, GDP growth that would be the envy of the Obama administration, improved living standards, an impressive start to recovery of educational, legal, and security institutions, major infrastructure projects. I could go on, but I'm not actually running your campaign. And so I, I, <laughs> so I, I don't think I will go on. Of course, so much remains to be done, and we are all aware that Liberia exists in a tough neighborhood and that you have to think about your region as well as your country. Madam President, ladies and gentlemen, the 21st century is young, but I believe that when the history of the century is written, that the story of Liberia will go down as a, a very fine moment in Africa's modern history. And you are a central person in that story. Your courage in facing down those who would try to rule by physical intimidation to gain power and to hold power is a story that sends a, a powerful signal of hope to civilian leaders uh, all over the continent. Your success in organizing women activists to campaign democratically for, for office is a metaphor for the emergence uh, of women leaders in a region which sorely needs them. And your vision of institutionalizing democratic governance in Africa is an inspiration to all of us. Could I ask you to please join me in welcoming President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf to the podium. Thank you, Chet, for that introduction. Uh, Madam Executive Vice President, Tara Sonnenshine, other members of the board, Chet again, Crocker, Kerry Kennedy, Secretary Carlson, distinguished guests, participants, friends, as so many of you are good friends, whom we have known for many years. I want to thank you, um, Dr. Raymond Gilpin, Richard Solomon, Ambassador Crocker, and the staff of the United States Institute for Peace for affording me this opportunity to talk to you about Liberia, its progress, its challenges. 
I've come to Washington to meet the new leadership of, of Congress, Republicans and Democrats, reinforce the bipartisan support that our country has enjoyed over the years. And we spent a lot of time these last two days on the Hill trying to be strong advocates for our country and the continuation of support in what we know are difficult times. We are mindful of the continuing priorities, competing priorities in the world and the challenges in your own homeland with high unemployment and a sluggish economy. In this environment and on behalf of the Liberian people, it's incumbent upon us to inform you, to inform the U.S. congressional leaders of how well your scarce resources have been put to work in our country. Liberia has risen from the ashes of war and destruction to become an emerging democratic nation with the potential to lift itself out of a dire situation in what is really a volatile subregion. In 2003, many of you in this room may recall, Congress, the US Congress supported a 200 million contribution to Liberia's transition, providing for the stabilization force of the United Nations mission in Liberia. This came right after the war. It, again, it was your Congress that appropriated the funds to support Liberia's democratic elections in 2005, an election that made history in electing me president of Liberia, becoming the first woman in Liberia and in Africa to be able to hold that position. Over the past years, as the House and Senate change hands, We've been fortunate that support to Liberia has been sustained. And we know that so many of you in this room have contributed to ensuring that this support has remained in place. Given such strong support, my message in meetings with the Congress was first and foremost to say a big thank you to them and through them to you, the American people, for playing such a leadership role in encouraging us to be able to take the stand that we have and in encouraging other partnership countries to join us in supporting the agenda that has led us to this place of progress. In advocating for strong partnership between our two nations, I also made the case for continued U.S. assistance to Sub-Saharan Africa. Africa has indeed come a long way from those days of depressed economies, autocratic rule. Today, 17 countries are considered emerging nations, having put in place strong economic policies, having sustained long years of economic reform, political reform, that have enabled them to reach this level. Liberia is not yet an emerging country, but we are considered a threshold one, meaning we're on the way to becoming one, what, what we hope will be just a few years. Liberia is eight years into what we see as a two decade of progress, of recovery and development. In the, last, in the past eight years, we have cleared some significant hurdles but the challenges that lie ahead are perhaps the most important ones to tackle. They include building the institutions of government, of civil society, and building a private economy that will provide for future generations. When I came into office five years ago, we met a country that was completely destroyed and in need of complete reconstruction of both the state and the society. Post-war reconstruction in Liberia is all-encompassing 
for it involves the economy, security, basic services, governance, national status, and national healing. Economically, our problem started decades earlier. Our gross domestic product was in steady decline since 1979, went into free fall when the war broke out. By 1989, by 1995, it had fallen by 90%, one of the fastest drop in history. By the elections in 2005, average income was a quarter of what it had been in 1987 and one-sixth of the 1979 level. Years of mismanagement, excessive borrowing, spending and payment defaults left a colossal external debt amounting to 800% of GDP. While these statistics are themselves disturbing, they pale when compared to the more profound challenges, including the loss of lives, livelihoods, and human dignity. During the years of violence, more than 250,000 people were killed, and over 500,000 were forced to flee their country and their homes, either as refugees or internal displaced persons. Families were shattered, communities uprooted, Governance systems destroyed, commercial and productive activities collapsed, infrastructure devastated. Our human infrastructure was in ruins. Just to give you a small example, we went from 800 practicing doctors in 1989 to just 50 by the year 2003. Our best and brightest across all professions had left the country. For our government, the scope and scale of the challenges facing Liberia could easily have been paralyzing, but we tried not to be that. We executed a 150-day plan, quickly followed by an interim poverty reduction strategy. These measures gave us a breathing space that we needed to take on fundamental reforms. In 2008, when we wrote our poverty reduction strategy, we regrouped our tasks into four pillars, peace and security, economic revitalization, infrastructure and basic services, governance, and the rule of law. It is through the hard work of the Liberian people that I can now stand before you today and say that our progress and the lessons we've learned along the way have got us to where we are today. Our immediate challenge was peace and security. As in the case with countries emerging from decades of civil war, we risked a return to violence, rebel armies, armed groups, former military soldiers needed to be vested in the democracy dividend. On the other side of the equation, we had no functioning army or police and the thousands of combatants yet to be demobilized, disarmed and reintegrated. The presence of the United Nations mission in Liberia in the immediate post-war period was essential and necessary to Liberia's recovery, as it provided us a guarantee of safety for our people. One of the first lessons from the Liberian experience is that outside intervention, including military intervention, can be critical to a plan of national stabilization. As UNMIL is reducing its presence in Liberia, we have made strides in providing for our own security, including developing a new professionally trained army of 2,000 persons. We know we have more to do, but we feel that we've taken the necessary first step. We know we need to further train 
and expand our military and develop a police capacity to deal with low-level crime and disorder that disrupt people's quality of life and their sense of security. In the long term, the police and the judicial reforms are keys not only to stability, but to the successful plans of our poverty reduction strategy. Our next challenge in revitalizing the economy, and I'm proud to say that we've been very successful on that front. Liberia Key had an external debt of some 4.9 billion, a national budget of 80 million, per capita GDP of $160. Today, we have raised the national budget to close to 370 million, attracted over 16 billion in direct foreign investment, and retired the bulk of that 4.9 billion debt. <laughs> Our income per capita has risen by approximately one third. And despite the 2009 global financial crisis, we have been able to have a GDP that has averaged 6.5% and brought our inflation rate down from 20% into single digit digits. We're proud that today, Liberia is classified one of the 20 fastest growing economies in the world. And by the World Bank rated in 2010, the World Bank doing business, one of the 10 reformers. The attraction of private capital and return of confidence to the private marketplace is to us the truest sign of recovery of a nation. Among the multinational companies that have already committed to invest billions in Liberia include, from your country, Delta Airlines, which has resumed flights, increasing it now from one to three flights a week. Chevron, which has recently opened offices in Liberia and will be starting offshore drilling by the end of this year. Asselo Motel, not an American firm, but one of the oldest ones, which um, have started to reopen the mines. And of course, Firestone, the one that has been with us for some 80 years, involved in replanting and have completely changed um, the workplace on the plantation. So today, one can see that um, no longer will Firestone think we put a quote by the AFL-CIO for the mistreatment of workers. <laughs> the achievement we are probably most proud of is our debt relief. We've been able to do this by relentlessly pursuing sound public financial management on a three-year program assisted by the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Of course, all of these will remain empty facts and statistics if collectively they do not create the jobs for the Liberian people. Unemployment thus is one of our biggest challenge and a priority of our government. Employment for the thousands and thousands of young people, many of whom were child soldiers who did not have the opportunity to go to school or to get a skill. What we need to do is to find a way to make them into productive participants in the economy. And that's not an easy task when you're dealing with 15 to 20 year olds who have not had an opportunity to be able to become professionals or to be able to make a contribution to their country's rebuilding. We know that relying on our natural wealth, that foreign investment alone will not create jobs. We need to go one step beyond, beyond our own traditional experience and the experience of many of our African countries. We need more value added, more labor intensive industry, more small, more small businesses, more vocational training, and a sustained and renewed effort 
to raise the educational standards for all of our citizens. Our third challenge, governance and the rule of law. The war destroyed all the institutions and infrastructure that protected these principles. Thus, we had to rehabilitate and promote freedom of speech, an essential right, protected by a free and independent media, as well as an open and just court system. Decades of deprivation and bad governance eroded the norms and value system in our country and created a culture of corruption and rent-seeking behavior. Battling corruption is at its core a battle of ideas, a battle of values, a battle of attitudes. We have been trying to take an approach that's both systemic and preventive, and we have made progress. We sought to strengthen the principles of transparency so that Liberia became the first country in West Africa to pass its Freedom of Information Act, as well as the first country to become fully compliant with the Executive Industry Transparency Initiative. We sought to, str to strengthen the principle of fairness and professionalism by increasing compensation to reduce the incentive for corruption and graft. We sought to strengthen the principles of accountability by restructuring and strengthening our General Auditing Commission and establishing the Liberia Anti-Corruption Commission. As a result of our action, we moved up 41 places on Transparency International Global Corruption Index and more recently up another 10 points, moving from 97 to 87. Equally significant for our strong and young government, we qualified as a threshold country on the Millennium Challenge account and have made our first export under AGOA. Despite these advances, much more needs to be done, and we are very mindful of that. The punishment aspect of fighting corruption remains a missing link, and while the challenge is enormous, we'll devote our energy in the coming months to tackling this malaise. We are in the process of reforming the judiciary, reviewing our jury system, and looking at the prosecuting powers of our institutes of integrity. The fourth pillar of our recovery is building infrastructure and restoring basic services of government. Liberia emerged from the years of war with almost non-existing infrastructure, and we set out on a long and grueling process of rebuilding key infrastructure virtually from scratch. I'm proud to report that we started to rebuild roads, bridges, schools, clinics, restored lights, and water, all missing in the capital city for decades. It was so pleasing to us when we turned on the first street lights that children danced and they could study under the street lights lacking the lights in their homes. That those who for the first time not knowing that water came out of anything but a bucket, could see running water coming out of the taps. Those are the things that you take for granted, things that are missing, and when restored, can make a remarkable change in the life of a child. We will be moving in that direction as we try to we stole most of those services, and the rehabilitation of our hydro plant remained for us one of the most challenging and most required attention, as it represents the major constraints to enhancement of our security efforts and to enable us to move from the export of primary uh, products to adding value that makes us an agro-industrial state. Finally, we had to address a community still traumatized 
our national spirit, our national identity, our communal trust had been undermined. At the beginning, our partners assisted us in undertaking the huge process of disarming, demobilizing, and reintegrating thousands of our young people while training and education bypassed them. Restruction and recovery alone can only go so far. We need to grow our economy, to create a new and fairer distribution of wealth with equal and sufficient access to opportunity by all. Only then can we address the realities of poverty exacerbated by 14 years of war. Our process of national healing and reconciliation is neither perfect nor complete, but we are convinced that we've made the necessary first step in this long journey. Our young people are ready and are embracing the return to school return to training, return to productive endeavor, and return to peace. Our progress depends on a system which shows the peaceful transfer of power through the exercise of choice, the institutionalization of democracy. That is why this year, our national election year, is critical to our recovery. It puts to test all the work we have done to create a strong society, an open society, a democratic society. The national contest will test our democratic principles, our multi-party system, and our independent ju judiciary. Without these, there's no sustainable progress in a post-conflict country. I stand before you as the leader of a country no longer looking for handouts, but rather a nation in search of true partnership. As I stated earlier, and emphatically, we came to Washington to make the case for sustained foreign assistance to Liberia. We are not seeking an open-ended commitment, but rather a sport in the next few years of this transition. If it happens, I'm confident and I've made the commitment that Liberia will sustain its own development. We shall not ask for foreign assistance in 10 years. I can go further to say that as we develop our long-term perspective in our development agenda, that Liberia is determined to join the ranks of middle-income countries by the year 2030. I won't be around to see it, <laughs> but I'm confident that I would have put in place all of, the, all of that it takes to make sure that there's no reversal and make sure that we will achieve that objective. At a time when you, you in the United States, are debating the future of your foreign assistance program, I hope we have made a case for Liberia and a case for Liberia's future. I want to assure you that the aid that has been given to Liberia to date has been put to effective use. We could not have achieved the progress we had on the basis of the resources with which we started. And it was the supplementary ones that you gave, both technical moral and financial that has enabled us to achieve what we have. Dear friends, Liberia is moving to the next phase of development from stabilization to sustained economic growth. 
This means responsibly and transparently harnessing our abundant natural resources, while at the same time cultivating new niches in manufacturing and services. This means investing in our most important assets, the Liberian people. It also means building upon the gains we have made in rebuilding our infrastructure and in further reforming governance and the promotion and respect for fundamental and human rights under the rule of law. In Liberia, as elsewhere in Africa, our gains are fragile. Our institutions must be rebuilt and reformed and sustained through the shifting winds of politics and the dynamics of change. The situation which recently pertained in our neighboring state, Cote d'Ivoire, served as a reminder of how easily it is for a country to slip back into violence and how quickly the hard-earned progress can be turned back. For Liberia's part, we continue to cope with 150,000 refugees from Cote d'Ivoire, as well as mercenaries who continue to move through our poorest borders. We continue to work with our neighboring states with which we enjoy the best of relations as we collectively try to ensure that peace and stability maintains in our subregion. Our successes are not merely our own, but the product of hard work by the Liberian people and our friends abroad, such as you in this room. It is our strong belief that Liberia will hit its benchmarks for development and national rebirth, and that the lessons learned from our experience can be applied to our world in transition. Liberia is in business. Liberia is on a move. Thank you. Uh, Madam President for that very comprehensive overview. Um, it's very heartening to um, see and hear all the progress that has been made, but we also note that you uh, pointed out some of the challenges that lie ahead. Um, this is the fun part, and if you've written a question, please pass it down the aisle, and um, if you're in the overflow room, do likewise, and the questions would uh, make their way to the front, and we'll pose as many to um, the President as we could. And while that's going on, I'll use my prerogative as a moderator to ask the first question. Um, you mentioned significant gains in terms of economic growth, but also challenges regarding distribution of wealth. Um, could you comment on that in the context of the lingering um, conflict um, dynamics in Liberia and countries like Liberia? How do you uh, make sure that the um, economic growth translates into human security for the um, bulk of the people? Um, we've chosen, first of all, to, to promote growth, but we also know that um, the distribution of growth is very skewed in our country. You still have a small segment of the population that enjoy a, a higher share for income, and at the bottom, very low per capita income. Our way to address that is through education, skills training to enable people to be able to become professionals, to earn higher income, to bring basic services to them, to ensure that um, there's food security by promoting agriculture. And we're beginning to see the change, but it will take some time to get the kind of equal distribution that one would like to see as we begin to move the lower segment of the population, the larger numbers of the population, up the income ladder. Uh, thank you. Um, you mentioned that an education is very important. And we have a question here from 10-year-old Zoe Denton, um, who wants to know, what would you do to encourage children from Liberia that live in America help children in Liberia? 
you know, I think you could send, send a note to a child, you know, we can identify some, a little note encouraging them to go to school, to stay in school. Um, a discarded book that you may want to share with, with a child across the ocean uh, would be helpful. And certainly when we go back and I meet the children as I always do, I will carry those messages from, from the children from here that says that uh, they're pleased with the fact that they're going to school and they're studying hard and they're back in uniforms, and, and I think that's gonna be encouraging to them. Thank you very much. Um, there are a couple of questions here about um, security, security sector reform, and one in particular um, highlights um, the United Nations uh, military um, mission, observer mission in Liberia, UNMIL. Um, and the question is, um, what do you see as the future of UNMIL in Liberia, and do you think that um, it should, over time, um, draw down, and how quickly should that happen? Uh, we have a drawdown plan that's been agreed, and the drawdown has started. It's tabled now at about 8,000 persons. Uh, we expect that number to remain for the next couple of years, at least, as we get past the elections. But the ultimate test of security is when UNMIL does leave, and at some point they should leave. That will be the biggest signal that the country is secure, that the country is stable, and that our own security forces take prime responsibility for the security of the state. And so we're working toward achieving that objective uh, within two to three years. Thank you very much. And also, if you're joining us by webcast, please send your questions via Twitter or email. Um, details are available on our website. Um, still on security, uh, Madam President, um, there are two questions here about the implications of what's going on in Cote d'Ivoire, instability in Cote d'Ivoire in Liberia. You mentioned the number of refugees, um, the porosity of the borders. Is there a strategy in place to address this over the long term? And what are your views about sub-regional security prospects in the years ahead? The, the refugee problem has two dimensions, humanitarian aid. Uh, our own villages have, have um, welcomed the refugees and, and to a certain extent integrated them into their society. Uh, the response from the international community uh, is slower than we'd anticipated, but we're trying our best to cope with that. The security aspect has to do with um, the cross-border movements. Uh, many of uh, those come from the same ethnic groups across the border. Uh, they come back armed. Um, it could represent a risk to our sub-region, a risk to Liberia, a risk to Cote d'Ivoire, if the returning ex-mercenaries with arms decide to regroup and to try to destabilize, it's a problem for us. Our response is to, to increase the security on the borders, including uh, some of the peacekeeping force that are there. Not enough to be able to cover, like you say, borders, borders, forested areas where people can hide so easily. Um, but we're trying our best, best to cope with it and trying to be as vigilant as we can. And we're cooperating. Uh, the leaders in, in all of our countries are cooperating in exchanging intelligence and making sure that um, we all step up and enhance our surveillance action. Uh, thank you very much. Is there a, a particular role the international community could play in this regard? Because history... Um, tells us that um, these security concerns could become sub-regional very quickly and affect a lot more countries even beyond Liberia and Cote d'Ivoire. I'll use the same phrase that many of you are familiar with. Reduce the time from commitment to cash. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, I think that's... Um, sage advice <laughs> from a policy perspective. Um, there are a number of questions about the Liberia's natural resources. You have a very ambitious and I think uh, realistic um, program to make sure that in 10 years, Liberia does not require foreign assistance. And this suggests that the natural resources will be not just um, adding to economic growth, but also supporting broad-based economic development across Liberia. Um, could you speak about that in a bit more detail, about the role of natural resources and the environment 
in Liberia's future? Um, as I mentioned, Liberia is natural resource rich. We have a relatively small population. If we can use those resources properly, allocate them efficiently, and address the basic needs of the people, infrastructure needs, social infrastructure, economic infrastructure, um, there should be no reason why we would do that. What are the resources we have? We have mineral resources, iron ore, gold, diamond. Um, agricultural resources, we're still an agrarian nation. Most of our people are in farming. Um, we have both in terms of food security, we should address some of the needs of the poor as well as in export agriculture, where rubber, oil palm, coffee, cocoa are all traditional products for us. We have forestry resources. Liberia commands 45% of the biodiversity in West Africa. The sanctions helped us in a way because our forests were not cut. Uh, so, but we also know when it comes to forestry that we're a part of the global effort to address climate change. And we know that uh, unless we can be a part of conserving our forests, that we could become part of the problem of greenhouse gases. So we have a, a program that we say the three C's, commercialization, uh, conservation, and community benefits to ensure that the communities too benefit from the exploitation of those resources. We have fishery potential in we an ocean nation. Uh, so our challenge is to make sure that as we exploit those resources, and petroleum is now looking good. I don't think Chevron would be there. Where's Chevron if it didn't look good? <laughs> <laughs> um, but we also, in, in, we also insist that those that have been granted um, ex exploitation rights have corporate social responsibility, that they must do in the communities in which they operate. They must give back something, roads, schools, medical services, training. And I must say that they are doing that. So that's how we make sure that the resources of the country will be able to be distributed in such a way that it will lift our people. And thank you. There are three um, questions here that relate to your comment on unemployment being one of the biggest challenges you face. And um, looking at the demographics, it's primarily youth unemployment. Um, what plans do you have to address youth unemployment and um, how would this um, ensure an intergenerational transfer of knowledge and skills? Um, it's a problem. We think skills training is the best. For those who are able to, who are young enough to go back to school, we've encouraged that. In those cases where young adults cannot go back to basic academic training, we're trying to rehabilitate our vocational institutions and get new ones to be able to give them a skills. Um, small enterprises, uh, our central bank is putting facility out to help them to become, to do small things, trading, farming. Um, I was just saying there's a great industry that has started with public transport and motorcycles. <laughs> Most of the ex-combatants now, they have an association of motorcyclists. And for them, it's a, it's a great industry. I mean, they go on the secondary roads, and they transport people, they transport produce. And, and for them, so what, what can we do now is to give them better skills, better training, better protection as they carry out that service. So we're trying to identify the means whereby um, they can become productive. And that, that we, we, we hope will solve some of the employment problem. We also have um, questions relating to the transferability of the uh, Liberian experience, both in terms of 
the democratic, consolidating the democratic um, process and uh, revitalizing economic growth. And a couple of other um, country, African countries have been mentioned and saying what could they learn from um, Liberia's um, experience and how transferable is it for other conflict affected countries in Africa? We hope that there's certain elements of transferability. For example, Somalia sent a, sent a team to Liberia to talk about you know, post-conflict, what are some of the measures we did in our economic policy, our 150-day deliverables. And they had good exchanges um, you know, with the relevant authorities in the government. Uh, we hope that they'll be able to learn from some of those lessons of experience. We're still learning from others, too. I, we think you know, countries like uh, Rwanda and Ghana and others have important lessons that we can learn, and we can pattern ourselves after. Um, there's some innovations that, that we have that uh, many countries are now looking at. For example, our approach to uh, philanthropy. We establish a philanthropic secretariat where we, we bring them all together rather than each uh, philanthropic organization doing its own thing across the country, reflecting its own priorities and policies, where we bring them together and decide on activities in which they can pool resources and, and then have a scaling up in important activities. And we guide that. That's a process that's being looked at by other countries. So um, we hope some of our lessons will be uh, applicable to other circumstances and countries. Thank you very much. Um, it's no secret that you are an inspiration to women everywhere. And so it's no surprise that we have. <laughs> it's no surprise that we have at least three or four questions on the national response to gender-based societal issues in Liberia. Could you speak a bit more about the national action plan and what practical steps are being taken to um, combat discrimination at national, local, and community levels in, in Liberia? Well, when it comes to discrimination, I, I think I'm the best example. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but what, what, um, what we have done in our national plan, really, is to address uh, sexual-based violence, you know, gender-based violence that, that's, that's in our society. Uh, we've established a special court to be able to deal with, um, with violence against women. We've established special uh, units in our Ministry of Gender to, do, to deal with that. Uh, rape is a problem in our society, and we're trying to, to address that through our women groups. Our national plan of action is to ensure that our laws and our policies uh, have no elements of discrimination in them. Uh, and so, and we have women groups that are supported for this association of women lawyers uh, to, to be able to work, you know, with, with the special courts. So, but, you know, like every other country, we still don't have full equality. Mm -hmm. um, we, I, I tried to, I thought very seriously about an all-woman cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't quite achieved that yet. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you very much. A couple of questions, uh, Madam President, on your meetings in Capitol Hill. Um, and one question says, um, what message would you have for the average U.S. taxpayer who is concerned about the effectiveness of foreign assistance in conflict-affected countries like Liberia? Your taxpayer should know that your money has been spent to bring peace, stability, and to set a country on the course for development in such a way that it will graduate from assistance. We say Liberia is on the way to becoming a post-conflict success story. And that success is not only Liberia's success, 
it is also the United States' success because you've been our number one partner. And Madam President, one of your legacies would, would be the consolidation of democratic institutions in Liberia. Um, with elections upcoming, there's one question about the strength of the institutions to sustain this momentum. Could you speak a bit about the electoral process and electoral institutions and what is being done to ensure that there is a smooth um, transition or process in the upcoming elections? For one thing, we've invited a strong partnership among all our bilateral partners in working with our Elections Commission to ensure that they're properly capacitated, to ensure that their processes will ensure transparency, free and fair elections. We have a multi-party system. We have a civil society that is very, very assertive aggressive and participate in every way in our society. We have a media that is open. We, we won the, the prize, Liberia won the prize for freedoms, for media freedoms. Uh, and so that in itself forces accountability and forces transparency. And we've invited our partners not to see our elections as a one week or one day event, but to be a part of the process so that uh, we can benefit from the experience of others that have had good elections. And so we're hoping, but you know, politics are politics. So you're gonna, there's a lot of verbal battles going on. Um, we hope it remains verbal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think we're looking forward to, we've had an elections commission that has, that has uh, run many by-elections. And those by-elections, if anyone wants to say, have been, if you look at the results, it shows that um, there were fairness in it because there's no ruling party that won the by-elections. We lost 50% of them. <laughs> so, so, but um, we, we welcome where we're looking at some, some innovative things that happened in places like the recent Nigeria elections where mm -hmm. cell phones became the mode, the, the main instrument for fairness to make sure that people knew results before official results, the results were translated by cell phones to, to, to different people, so the tally could be compared with the official results, could be compared with the, with the private results, and we're, we're going to, to, to try to, to do that same thing, to make sure that, because it's important that, that the elections are accepted and free and fair, and that whatever, whoever is giving that mandate has a very clear mandate to move the country forward. Absolutely. And you mentioned cell phones. Um, I have a question on cell phones, new media, Facebook, the internet. What are your thoughts on recent developments in North Africa and possible implications for the rest of the continent? If there's anything that everyone wants in Liberia is a cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> no matter where you go. Uh, I think what, we have 1.2 million users. Uh, in a country where you know the building out the system is so limited in so many places, that just goes to tell you there's something. Now, I'm told about Twitter and Facebook. I don't know those ones, you know. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> I'm sure many of our young people do them. <laughs> Um, you, you, you mentioned in, in a response to an earlier question about your philanthropy secretariat that um, coordinates the um, philanthropic uh, donations or interest in Liberia. Do you have any thoughts about coordinating bilateral and multilateral assistance? Because you think about the Paris Declaration, the follow-up in Accra, the discussion about aid effectiveness had a very, very lengthy sidebar on coordinating multilateral and bilateral assistance. Any thoughts for Liberia? Yeah, we do have some coordination, coordinating mechanisms to ensure that um, multilateral and bilateral aid come together um, in a harmonized you know, a way, thereby making it more effective. It's a difficult task because you're still dealing with 
with individual countries that have their own priorities and their own processes and their own policies. So getting that coordination um, can go so far and no further. Uh, so, but we continue to work at it. We continue to say that uh, if you believe in the ownership principle, that the priorities should be our national priorities and, and you should adjust your assistance to those priorities. It works to a certain extent, but there there are always, you know, uh, a little bit of difference um, where people have their own mindset and their own policies and it's their resources. So you have to find compromises to make sure that um, you get the coordination, but at the same time also respect the, you know, the views and the policies of others. Thank you. Um, I'll give the final question to the diaspora. We had at least five questions from members of diaspora asking exactly how could they help? How could they be involved in what's going on in Liberia? And are there ways that um, they could transfer their skills and their energies and resources to support? Absolutely. Remittances are still a major <laughs> part you know, of our resources. Um, Liberians in the diaspora send money back to their families, you know, and to their institutions and whatnot, and that's a very important element uh, in it. We would like to see the skills come back, and that's starting to happen uh, in a, a slow pace. Obviously, our economy has to be prepared to, to absorb them and to give them the, the level of compensation and services to which they become accustomed. Um, but but that's starting, and we're also encouraging them to, for those who cannot come back right away permanently, that uh, they might use some of their vacation time and do you know, some service in the area of their profession by coming. We have one such group, um, the HEART program, in which um, doctors, one of which is my own son, who helped to organize it, where he gets a group of doctors from here, and they go out and they work in the hospitals for a month, two weeks, and they have a rotating scheme, and it involves some Liberian doctors, but a lot of um, American doctors with whom he works. And we'd like to see that happen in some of the other professions, you know, in engineering, uh, where we have a basic scarcity at a time when we have all these, these major concessions and major entities opening up. Uh, we don't have the skills in that area, and we like to attract those in the diaspora. Liberians first, and Africans next, and then everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> There's room for all. There's room for all. <laughs> no, um, Madam President, on behalf of our, of our president, um, Ambassador Richard Solomon, staff of the Institute, and all our guests, we'd like to thank you very much for being so generous with your time and sharing so freely and frankly with us. Um, thank you so much, and we wish um, you and like the, all the people of Liberia every success. Um, thanks also to um, Reva Levingson and KRL for um, being so supportive, and to Amanda Mayoral and the great team here at USIP for making this possible. Um, May I ask that we um, remain seated as the uh, president and her entourage leave, but before, as she does, join me in thanking her for an excellent speech. <laughs>